Actually, uh, Juno Aguilar's in Singapore. Uh, he wrote this a couple of days back, and it's published with Rappler, so I'll, I'll truncate it, and if you want to read the entire thing, it's just, it's free online. So, um, the title of the piece is Benedict Anderson, The Philippines' Place in the World. Um, are you an evangelist for the Philippines? A Latin American scholar asked Professor Benedict Anderson in one event uh, that uh, in in one event that was part of his world. Ben's interlocutor said, "In under three flags, the Philippines was being discussed for the first time alongside Cuba and Puerto Rico, and of course Spain. These and other countries were tied together by a network of political anarchists with whom the Ilustrados of the late 19th century were entangled." In the introduction to Under Three Flags, Ben made it clear that his book, the closest to a novel that he could write, quote, embarks from the Philippines for two simple reasons. The first is that I am deeply attached to it and have studied it on and off for 20 years. The second is that in the 1890s, though on the outer periphery of the world system, it briefly play played a world role which has since eluded it, end quote. In his attachment to Philippines, Notwithstanding its rapacious political elite, whose genealogy he traced famously in his essay, Cacique Democracy in the Philippines, Ben had taken it as if it were the native po Ben had taken as Ben had taken as it as if it were from the native point of view, engaging in what Filipino intellectuals from the late 19th century until today have sought to do, locate the Philippines in global history and consider it an important actor in the international scene. Given his, given his towering stature in the world of scholarship, Ben Anderson contributed so much more than many of us could ever dream of achieving. In fact, in imagined communities, Anderson used the opening lines of the Noli as an example of the intimacy that the novel conjured between authors and readers. In much the same way that the nation generates a sense of intimacy among the members of this imagined community. To clarify many tendentious assertions about Rizal's novel, novels, Ben also resorted to a quantitative approach in which he manually counted the occurrence of key terms, first in the Noli and then in El, in El Filibusterismo. His two articles were first published in Philippine Studies and then put together as a slim volume under the title Why Counting Counts uh, under Ateneo Press. Amid his cunning counting, Ben noted conspicuous absences such as the paucity of references to the ethnic diversity of the Philippines in the first novel, and to political ideas, classes, and institutions in the second. Ben also made us notice that unlike non-serious characters in the Noli, Elias spoke in perfect Spanish as a mark that he was not contaminated by coloniality. Yet in the Philippine, uh, yet in the Philly, Ben was excited about Rizal's use of Espanol de Parian, the language of the marketplace that we can identify with Chabacano, which Ben thought could have been a lingua franca for the Philippines had the U.S. not come into the picture. What study the Philippine lacks, Ben has always insisted, is an in-depth history of the Catholic Church in the 20th century. This institution has been off limits from critical scrutiny, as though a lesser majest law existed. This challenge remains to be taken up by a Filipino scholar. Ben Anderson taught us to see the Philippines in comparative terms, even if the exercise could be dizzying. To encapsulate this double vision, Ben borrowed Rizal's phrase, El, Demo El Demonio de las Comparaciones, which he turned into, a into the title of a collection of essays on Southeast Asia, Spectre of Comparisons. Ben saw the Philippines in world historical terms. Despite our own inhibition, we need to cultivate the same sensibility. We lament his passing, but at the same time are grateful for his missionary work on behalf of the Philippines.